I'm going to look at um, data and analytics. First of all, I'm going to look at um, some of the different types of data that we can collect today and how we can analyze this. Then I'm going to look at how a security firm is using a connected lighting system to enhance their offer, uh, before finishing off with a sort of quick look at the future and say perhaps the next step in terms of the Internet of Things. So we've all heard the phrase big data. I think it's already been mentioned a couple of times today. And data is the big thing when it comes to a connected <coughs> lighting system. When you think about lighting and rooms within a building, everywhere a person may go within a building, there's going to be some form of light that potentially could collect data on that area, that space, that, that room. Now, not all of the data that we can collect from these, from these luminaires could be deemed as being useful, but with the correct data, which is analysed in the correct way, then we can help to speed up our return on investment in terms of our assets or our, or our buildings. So to look at some of the data that we can collect today and how it can be analysed, the first is occupancy data. This is collected through our presence and absence detectors. Uh, the most common way that this is being shown is via heat mapping, so something, something like this, where areas of, of darker colour, such as down here on the top, top corner there, represent areas of greater occupancy. Um, and this can be used by, by building owners to, to see how their space is actually being used. And then they can use this data to then optimise their sort of building, building layout. Because these sensors are collecting data continuously over the months and years, it's much easier to um, identify trends in how the building is being used. If we take this example on the screen, there's a meeting room up here that currently is, is empty. But should it turn out that that meeting room actually is empty for 95% of the time during the year, does it still need to be a meeting room? If you're running out of space in terms of offices or desks, could you change the, change the function of that room to be maybe an office or, or more, more desks or even a breakout space? The next type of data we can, we can collect is, is temperature data. This can be either inward looking or, or outward looking. In terms of inward looking functionality, we can have sensors on critical components such as drivers, LED boards, uh, batteries for emergency luminaires. And we can use this information to see if our, if our components are operating in the correct temperature parameters. If there, as the example we've seen today, if there's a driver that's, that's too hot or a luminaire that's too hot, then could the driver, driver dim, it, dim the luminaire down to save in terms of, in terms of temperature? Or could a message or an email be sent to the on-site maintenance team for them to go and inspect why this, this fitting is constantly running over, over temperature? In terms of outward-looking functionality, we can use temperature sensors to monitor the temperature within a room, um, particularly in rooms where temperature is critical, such as server rooms or, or, or call rooms. We could link this then back to the, the HVAC system, so our temperature in our room would be adjusted in accordance to what's being read by, by, the, one, by the one sensor. Mm -hmm. And again, if there, there's issues in the room, perhaps we could get the maintenance team to, to go in and, and look and see what the, the reason for this might be. And we're actually starting to see some systems now uh, in terms of lighting controls where they're actually able to estimate the number of people within the room based on the increase in, in heat in that, in that space. So if you had a, an example like today where we've got a number of people in for a seminar and you're expecting, say, 50 people to turn up, but actually 75 people turned up, could that information be relayed to perhaps someone who's, who's ordering lunch for the day and, and let them know that actually they need to increase their lunch order so no one goes hungry at lunchtime? The next type of data is something we've been able to do for, for years, is to collect data in terms of emergency lighting. We've already spoken about um, te recording test records and, and scheduling scheduling tests in terms of, in terms of emergency. Um, but what we're now starting to see actually are components that are becoming more intelligent. And so we can see inverters that are actually able to record when a maintained supply is, is um, connected to them. They're also then able to record when there's a power outage and how long that power outage was, was for. And again, this can help us in terms, of, in terms of maintenance and perhaps identifying any reasons for early failures or faults within our emergency luminaires. And we had a scenario a few years back where we had a project where we kept seeing early failure of, sort of batteries. Um, so we sent out some replacement batteries, thinking, oh, it might just be a bad battery or something like that. And we got reports again that the batteries were failing. So we sent out inverters and batteries. Maybe it was something to do with the charging. And then we got another report saying that the same batteries, the ones we replaced twice already, were, were failing again. So we sent out one of our, our engineers to site, and they took along this, this piece of equipment and actually monitored the maintained supply to some of the emergency fittings for a two, three months period. When we got this, this bit of equipment back and took all the data out of it, what we could actually see was that um, there had been regular failures of the, of the power to the, to the emergency fittings once a week for about three hours. 
So on further investigation with the, the on-site guys, it turned out that actually someone was being very diligent in their emergency testing and were carrying out full annual duration tests every week, which completely knackered out the batteries. So once we had advised them actually only need to do this once a year, we didn't get any more uh, reports of, of early failures. Another type of data we can collect, and we're already doing it, is, is lighting levels. So we can use lux level sensors to detect the amount of light within the space and then adjust the artificial light accordingly. So if we've got a space like this where we've got tons of daylight pouring in, there's no need to have our electric lights on at full, at full whack. Uh, we could also potentially link those sensors to uh, the blinds or have sensors externally uh, on a building linked to blinds. So when the sun is perhaps in a, a nuisance position where it's causing solar glare, then blinds automatically come down to block this out. And then once the sun's been brown, blinds open up again to allow the daylight to come, come back in. And uh, studies have shown that actually when it comes to, to manual blinds, we're really good at closing the blinds. But once the sun's moved around, we're really rubbish actually at opening them back up again. We tend to leave them closed. So we can still carry out the task we're doing because the artificial light is wrapped up to, to, to compensate, but we're missing out on all this wonderful daylight that could be pouring in. And then we have um, lux level sensors to record lux hours as well. Roger again has already mentioned about um, delicate art pieces that need to, be, need to be conserved. So we can use these sensors to record the amount of light and how long that light's been on an art piece. And we can let uh, curators, gallery owners know when their, their delicate pieces perhaps need to have their light levels reduced or need to go into dark storage for conservation. And then we have power consumption. So we can record data on the energy our buildings are, are using, our specific rooms they're using. And we can analyse this to see if our building is actually um, operating how we were expecting. Is it using the amount of energy we thought or is it using more energy? If it's using more energy, we can then delve deeper to see the reasons for this. Could it be that our um, timeouts on our sensors have been left at default when they should have been at 10 minutes? Perhaps our sensors have been left in presence when they should have been absence mode. Are your lux level sensors turned on? So they're just a few types of data that we can collect today and that we can use to, to help improve our, our buildings. So what I want to look at now is um, a collaboration with a security firm where they're using a combination of a connected lighting system IP cameras and IP speakers to help enhance their offer to their customers. Uh, particularly they're looking at trying to speed up the evacuation in terms of emergency scenarios, uh, fire being, being one of the, one, the main ones they're looking at. And the way the system works is that if a fire alarm is triggered, uh, the central operations is, is notified. One of the operators there can jump onto the system and they can log in and they can use the cameras to look about to see how far the fire is advanced, where the fire is, um, as well, uh, and see some of the occupancy in the, in the area. They can also then jump onto the lighting system and they're able to use the heat mapping uh, to see occupancy in areas where you can't have cameras, such as in changing rooms, toilets, etc. Because the, uh, the system refreshes every sort of three to five seconds, you can get an almost, almost real life picture of the occupancy within the building. And all of this can then be relayed back to any on site teams who are able to assist in terms of evacuation and get people out of the building quicker. All the while this is happening, a pre-recorded message is being played over the IP speakers. And lighting and, and safety often go hand in hand. If you think about that sort of dark, ominous alley, you feel much safer walking down at night if it were well lit. Lighting can go a long way, a long way to preventing crime, but it can also go as far as affecting the psyche of the person that's thinking of perhaps committing a crime. The same security firm are also using these, these cameras and, and the lighting control system again to enhance their offer in terms of safety for, for buildings. The way they're doing this is if one of the sensors or the cameras picks up movement outside, an operator can jump on the, on the system and increase the brightness outside, better for facial recognition when it comes to, to cameras, but they're also able to control the interior lighting. So what they could do is start turning on lights within a building to give the impression of perhaps an on-site security team where there may not be one might just be enough to deter someone from breaking into the building. And um, I've, uh, a company I worked for a, a long time ago, their uh, head office was broken into one, one evening, uh, but they had a, a fully integrated control system. What they were actually able to do was log into the system the next morning and they could actually see exactly which presence detectors had been triggered. So they could plot almost the exact path the intruder took through the building which meant that when the police arrived, they were able to better guide them to areas where there could be potential fingerprints, um, but also the staff working there. They were able to tell people, actually, this is the person that broke in who's been into your office. Do you want to just check all your stuff, make sure nothing's gone missing, that they might perhaps miss um, when they first get into the, into the building? 
So perhaps the Internet of Things and connected lighting could go further than just optimization of space and optimization of building performance. Perhaps it could help with the health and, and, and well-being of the people working within the space. Now I've got a, another rule of thumb for, for Graham to add to his list. This one from, from America, it's called the 33300 rule, and it's all to do with the associated cost within a building. And it says that for every square foot you'll spend three, uh, $3 on utilities, $30 on rent, and $300 on the, on the staff, on, on your employees. Now, even though it's only a, a rule of thumb and just sort of general figures, it gives us a useful insight to where there could be more um, saving within, within a building. Using that model, a 2% saving in terms of uh, energy efficiency would result in a 6 cent per square foot saving. However, if you could increase productivity by 2%, that would represent a $6 per square foot saving. Now, I know productivity increase is difficult to measure, but if we think back to the scenario of the automatic blinds, all that daylight coming in would make your environment a much better place to work. Perhaps you could have a few of these, these sick days that, that Graham's mentioned. So just to finish off, my sort of final thought for this, this session is I look into the future in terms of uh, data and analytics and using artificial intelligence and machine learning to, to improve it. Um, if we think of all the data that can be collected, just occupancy data, if I were to sit down and try and trawl through this to spot trends, it would take me an absolute, absolute age to do it. Whereas a computer would be able to uh, much more quickly identify any trends within this data. So once the computers and our lighting control system have actually been able to um, identify the trends, could we then have some form of machine learning whereby the control system not only identified the trends, but is actually able to react to them as well? Could the, could the control system recommission itself to better suit the way that the building is used? If we think of, of occupancy, if there's a corridor that's hardly ever used, could the control system see the data that this corridor is never used? but also see that the, the sensors in there have been set to, say, a 10-minute timeout. Could it then see this and then readjust to maybe a five-minute timeout, or even a five-minute, sort of after five minutes, go down to a setback level and then timeout after 10 minutes? We're then saving energy uh, within the building. Or perhaps there's an, an office space whereby every day the first thing the user does when they come in is, is dim the lights down because they find it too bright. Could the control system see this and then react to this? and set the maximum brightness for the luminaires when they come on to be 80%. Not only are we saving a little bit of energy because our, our, our luminaires aren't on at full brightness, also we're improving the sort of com comfortableness of the office space for the, person, for the person working there. And Richard's already mentioned about um, predictive maintenance. Could the system see trends in components that have failed or, and then realize what, what might happen just before a component fails? Say, at the last emergency lighting duration test, your battery lasted three hours and one minute. Could it see that chances are it's going to need to be replaced before, before the next test and then schedule some form of, of maintenance to take place? So to summarise, big data is here to stay. It's the big thing in terms of lighting controls and collecting data. There's lots of data that we, that we can collect, but not all of this data could be deemed useful. However, with the correct data and the correct Analytics, we could help to speed up the return on investment within our buildings and, and in our assets. And then finally, is artificial intelligence and machine learning the next step when it comes to, to big data and analytics? Thank you.